Well, welcome to the Jackson County Sheriff's Office podcast status check. This is our fourth episode, and I'm anxiously awaiting today's topic because I think it's very relevant to where we're at in, in our season in Jackson County, fire season. And today we're going to be talking about emergency management, preparedness, zones, um, what's going on currently with our, you know, with fires in our region, and things that we can do to, to be better uh, with response uh, with f- from a community standpoint and the things that we are are trying to accomplish in uh, Jackson County. So we have the Fire District 3 Chief, Mike Hussey. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Um, we've been working together for a while and many fires um, that we've we've worked in our region. And we have uh, Holly Powers, our Emergency Management Director. Uh, she's been with the county for a few years, but you've been in emergency management for how long? Uh, over 15 years. 15 years, I would yeah. say don't. I'm not director, I'm the emergency manager. Uh, just emergency manager. Just emergency manager. Manage. Yep. Okay, and of course, our one and only Sean Richards, uh, who oversees our SAR uh, Marine Patrol, um, and he is uh, probably the one of the most knowledgeable individuals we have in our agency with regards to evacuations and being a liaison to um, fire personnel during these emergencies. So, thanks for being here. You yeah. bet. All right. To be here. So. Today, uh, what I wanted to start off with was talking about zones, because this is kind of a newer thing to Jackson County, uh, but it's not new in other places. Uh, in fact, it's been around for, for several years, uh, but for us, it is new. And so let's just talk about like why and, and some of the benefits to zones and, and uh, why we switched to that. Yeah. Uh, so it was about 2022, the Oregon State Fire Chiefs Association had grant funding available. Um, and so they were looking at some statewide possible programs. Um, and at that point, they selected Jackson County and Deschutes County to run a pilot program on implementing zone type uh, evacuation um, procedures using a specific software. Um, then it was called Zone Haven. It's now Genesis Protect, which is, which is what we're using. Um, so our two counties were selected to go through that process process and then see if um, the zones would be how, how well that worked as, as a system here within the county, but also interagency when we have mutual aid coming in or um, our larger campaign type fires to be able to communicate um, not only with our first responders, but also with our community quickly about where the hazard is um, and how we can alert. Uh, over the two years or so from there, we held, um, gosh, over a dozen meetings across the county, um, and it represented from law enforcement, fire, public works, uh, from our local, uh, local level, state, and federal level. So we invited all of our partners to the table, and we literally printed out large maps on the table, and then we all would get around um, and look at the geography and, and um, the different portions of our county and literally draw out based on the community or what we call the traffic shed, you know, like mm. how the cars would move out of an yeah. area um, and just started going through the zones there in that way. Yeah, I know a lot of work went into that because Sean was pretty involved as, as you were and you just described. And then there's a lot of thought that does go into those zones, how densely populated, you know, like you said, ingress, ingress and and things uh, taken into consideration uh, that do impact evacuations in the event of emergencies. And so maybe, Sean, uh, you you do a lot of evacuation uh, work for, for our organization. Um some of the considerations with the zones that you think might be important for the public to know? Yeah. So we, we didn't take it lightly. So mm-hmm. we basically went out and the reason we had all those meetings over that two year period was to reach out to the experts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're not the expert in uh, the Lake, <clears throat> excuse me, Lake Creek area. Yeah. The fire chief is up there. He knows who sure. lives there. He knows how to get in and out and he knows where fires have burnt in the past. So we spent a lot of time mm-hmm. getting local knowledge of, of the best thing to do for our community to get it on a map the best we could. Yeah. Chief, your thoughts on? You know, he's absolutely right. There's a lot of ground truth in understanding the local movement, um, the terrain, the topography. And again, it's an all hazards map. Mm-hmm. We apply sure. it most times in wildfire season, but we're trying to take into consideration dam failures and just other significant events where we may have to... Uh, trigger some evacuations or notify uh, the community of a pending event. 
you know, in the field, it's been tremendous. It's not perfect, but it's a better tool than we used to have. If you imagine pulling a big three by five map out, putting it on the hood of a pickup, anchoring the corners down with rocks <laughs> yeah. and trying to draw and we've evacuation done that. points, yeah. that's how it was prior to 2022. And then we try and get a photo from the field <laughs> into somebody in an office who would draw the evacuation zones. This yeah. really expedited the process. Yeah, and in being part of a lot of evacuations and some, mm-hmm. frankly, some pretty terrifying emergencies like the Almeida and Obachain fire, um, you know, one of the one of the critiques, and I and I think it's it's fair, is the time it takes to get notifications out to the public, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, it's not that you know we don't want to notify the public uh, as quick as we can. But when we put something out, it has to be accurate, right? And, and it is difficult when you have a map and you have to draw pictures and poly, polygons mm-hmm. um, and try to figure out a description of that particular area and then translate that into messaging, alerting. And we'll talk about alerting today uh, extensively as well. But these zones really give, I think, first responders the opportunity to say, these areas are affected, let's get something out quickly. And then we can fine tune that messaging as, as the event goes on. But it really, I think, helps. And it really makes, uh, you know, the, the, the notification process simpler and you, pre-planning is easier. I mean, there's just a lot of benefits to it. And I think there's, um, it's a change. Mm-hmm. And I find that, you know, anytime there's change, there's difficulties for, for uh, people who are using the, the technology and then but people who have to absorb that like on the you know the the end user uh, our community and it is changed from what we've done before but I think it's important that uh, I think that I think this is a better process you know sheriff also to just communication not only yeah. between first responders but to the public yeah uh, before we would have to from the field give emergency management a description of what we want to done she would have to interpret that mm-hmm get back to us that yes is this really what you want yes that's what i want and then that paragraph or two had to go out to the public and then they had to interpret it yeah the zones it's three numbers yeah if you know your numbers you know what area is affected so it just really cleaned up communication all the way from the ground to the emergency responders to the citizens so it simplified everything and i think that was one of the big intents Oh yeah, no. I I mean I'm a big proponent of it. I think <clears throat> um, that that time. So for you, the emergency manager, mm-hmm. um, before we had zones, how long would it take? Do you think just on kind of an average, if we wanted to alert, say some, uh, say let's just use the Salt Creek fire that we're that we're currently uh, dealing with, mm-hmm. how long would it take to get that initial information out uh, at the time it got from you know the the field to you to the public? What was like? the turnaround do you think yeah so pre-zone i would say that was somewhere in the 20 to 30 minute range and sometimes that depended on the cell service for uh whoever the deputy or sergeant was on scene yeah because sometimes (laughs) they had to go down to the fire ic and they had to talk about uh, that area and then come into service so that we could actually communicate um, or it was relayed through dispatch so it could be that 20 to 30 minutes yeah to get that description draw the area and craft the messaging um so but with salt creek um, this is one of our first applications with the zones. Sure. Um, and we got that down to about 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, and some of that was just, it was our first time or second time using. So there was just those little processes that you're fine tuning every time you practice. So, um, but it really cut our alerting process in almost half. It also uh, just makes it so much easier to communicate. Um where those impacted areas are because on the emergency management side our primary focus is getting that alert out to support our first responders and what's needed in our community and then right after that we have a lot of other things we have to get moving sure. um, to be able to support yeah. a displaced population so being able to cut that down and, and message quickly um, is That's crucial it's crucial yeah and uh the genesis protect also um makes our mapping, our public facing mapping to communicate to the public, to, to Sean's point, much faster. So within a minute of us sending the alert, we'll have a map, the zones will be showing on the map, such, a, such as we can see here. And so the public can find the visualization of the area much quicker than in the past. We would have an hour or two delay sometimes because we'd have to log into another system or bring in another county specialist, GIS specialist to do it. So it's also oh, yeah. dramatically increased that. When we were uh, working 
in the Oba Chain and Almeida event in the uh, in the incident command post, uh, just creating a large map. I mean, that would take a couple hours, mm-hmm. generally speaking, of the affected area to get IT or somebody else uh, to come in and help with that process. So this is great. Um, yeah. And then, you know, just like you brought up a good point with cell service. If, you know, our radios generally work in rural areas, our police radios, not always, it's not perfect, but it is uh, a lot more reliable than cell phone. And to tell a dispatcher, hey, I need these three zones relayed to our emergency manager, go, is much easier than trying to write out descriptions and ensure that that's accurately uh, translated to emergency manager. So it is, I mean, there's a lot of benefits, mm-hmm. I think, to the public. Now, there are some downfalls, too, to be honest, like, yeah. you know, because, you know, we talk about all emergencies. Um, you know, if you're if you're thinking of solely going to zone, which we haven't totally, because I think Aaron still tries to put out some descriptions, and as do you guys, and uh, when we're communicating with the public. But you know, you might have a really small area that is affected. So, from a police standpoint or law enforcement standpoint, maybe we have a barricaded subject, and we have a a, a SWAT uh, call out to where we need to block streets or evacuate small portions of a neighborhood, but not a whole zone. Mm-hmm. So those things, you know, it doesn't work perfect for that, but there is no perfect solution or perfect. There's not one size fits all yeah. um, for emergencies. But I think this overall is substantially <laughs> better for our line staff and will be for our community. So let's talk about alerting. Yeah. Um, unless you have other things on the zones, because I think this ties into alerts um, pretty well, right? Like yeah. how those work and... Um, you know, what are the best platforms for alerting? What are not, what's not working? And, and how do we communicate with the public in an emergency? Yeah, for sure. So I'll, I guess I'll kick it off. I think, <coughs> I think the, the, the first one is what we think about is, is, is cell phone technology these days. So what mm-hmm. platforms do we have through cell uh, that are currently in use? Yeah, well, that's a broad question. So I would say on the alert and warning um, front in general, uh, our primary alert warning system is we, we brand it Citizen Alert. Everyone knows Citizen Alert. Uh, it's powered by Everbridge. That's the software we use. It's a you know very nationally, um, big national type company. So a lot of entities use it. And the entire state of Oregon actually uses Everbridge in their alert as their alerting platform. Um, so we all work together to create templates and systems and processes that, that can work across the state, which has been really beneficial. Um, so here in Jackson County, we've ha- actually had the Everbridge system and Citizen Alert since 2011. Um, and over the last 13, 14 years, there have been a lot of increases in efficiency and effectiveness um, and templating to uh, make our alerting more successful for our community. Um, so within the Citizen Alert, database, we'll call it. Um, We have multiple sets of data that we can use to alert people. Uh, People are most uh, aware of our opt-in. So that's where you go in and create an account and put in up to five different addresses like your house, your work, kids school, kids daycare, grandma's house. Um, So any of those places that you would want to receive an emergency alert about. Um, and then you can put up to two email addresses, uh, three three different phone numbers, and two different text messages. So um, if you have a work phone and a house phone, you can put those both on there, that sort of a mm. thing. Um, so that's our, our opt-in data, and that's the most useful data because the, our citizens and residents are providing that to us. So it's the best way we can get a hold of them. Yeah. Um, so we really try and push that. Are uh, you signed sure. up for Citizen Alert? Yeah, so that's an opt-in system, as we call it, right? And yep. so how many how many people – I know there was, after the initial Almeda and Obachain fires, there was a significant increase in, in people wanting to use that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I want to say it doubled or tripled or something it, like that. It, it almost tripled okay. uh, right, right around the week or so after Almeda – um, for the opt-in data. So, but right now we're still about 78,000 contact opt-ins, which if you look at our, at our population, that's, um, lower than we would hope. Right. So we, sure. we would love to have, um, you know, all of our residents opted in, uh, to, to receive notification. So that's why we continue to provide that, um, yeah. you know, messaging sure. of, across the board. So limitations with that platform goes to cell phone. So if Mm -hmm. cell phone towers get burned up, like say in a big fire, Mm -hmm. that could certainly hamper that communication. There's definitely limitations there. Um, We also purchased the 911 data. So if you have a copper landline through CenturyLink, um, we purchase that data and import that uh, 
two times a year. So any of our landline, not VoIP, but any of our landlines we have access to. So um, a lot, those lines usually stay up a little bit longer. Sure. Um, and there's some residents that, you know, in the rural areas where they might only have a landline um, or some of our other populations. So we purchased that data. And then Everbridge also has some data sets that they provide us, um, like some wireless and VoIP data that we're able to access in emergency. So we've kind of three different sets um, that gives us a decent coverage of the county, but it's not everyone. Sure. Um, we don't uh, have, have everyone's phone number be able to reach them, but it's just one of our mass communication opportunities to yep. hit the most people as quickly as possible in the event of emergency. So, so strongly encourage opt-in for that because that is important. Now, when you talk about like landlines and limitations, obviously mm -hmm. landlines are not as prevalent as they used to be. That's true. Um, and then, of course, when you get into the more rural areas, I don't know that um, phone companies are investing mm -mm. in upgrades in their technology. So there is some real significant limitations to how fast messaging can get to landlines, right? I mean, Correct. I can't remember, but it, I know the copper lines would only take so many messages it's at a time. Mm -hmm. And so to reach an area, say, that has no cell, but maybe say there's 150 homes or 200 homes, not all those homes are going to get the message at once. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Yeah. yeah. So we, we were fortunate enough to be able to work with, uh, with CenturyLink to understand the limitations of their circuits. And then we put on what we call throttles into those areas. So we're not overwhelming the circuits so that the message, the voice message can get through to those phone numbers as quickly as possible. Sure. Um, and then we also work to make sure that voice message is less than a minute, but still has all the detail in it because that really helps the, um, to get those phone calls through, um, um, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, but this is also a point where that community communication and effort is really key. So, sure. you know, if you get that phone call and you then, you know, go knock on your neighbor's door, maybe they were the last on the list, but now they've received a notification too. So, yeah. And we're going to talk a little bit about that with evacuations and preparedness as well, because that's an important piece of, yeah. of you know, sense of community and community awareness. <laughs> and of course, we can't be everywhere at once as law enforcement or fire. Or yeah. emergency management. And so uh, relying on our community to help us out is pretty important as well. Yeah. Um, so, Holly, we're, we're, so <clears throat> if a citizen's listening, how do they get signed up for Citizen Alert if, if they hear it today and yeah. want to get signed up? Appreciate Where that. do they do that? Yeah. So you can go to jacksoncountyor.gov slash alert. Um, and there you'll be able to see Citizen Alert. There's a sign up button with a little bullhorn. If you click on that, it'll take you to your account. But this is also good on this page, uh, on the county's webpage uh, for Citizen Alert. If you scroll down, it'll go through the different types of alerts. So uh, Sheriff, back to your question, Citizen Alert's our primary utilization for alert and warning. But through that system, we have access to additional um, ways to alert our community. Um, so one of the other opt-in components that we started in 2021, I think it was uh, June-ish of 2021, is our Jackson EVAX keyword. Um, we received a lot of feedback in emergency management about our residents wanting to know about any time there was an evacuation that happened in the county, whether or not it was impacting them directly. Yeah. Um, and through some of the upgrades to the alerting system, we were able to implement this keyword. Sure. So if you send, if you text Jackson EVAX to 888-777, then you receive just an abridged version of the alert um, of the area that went out um, that received the, the evacuation notification. But this goes back to where the zones has really helped us in this front because there's character limitations on those text messages. So now I can put in the zone number and those individuals who want to know about all of the evacuation alerts can more easily find those areas um, So for their situational awareness. Sure. And another great way for situational awareness is our Jackson County Sheriff's Office app because uh, we send out mm -hmm. uh, notifications of all evacuations on our apps and social media. And that's a great way to stay, you know, aware of things that are going on within the county as well. So, I mean, another good tool for yes. people to stay informed. Yeah. I think it's important to note the region and the state have invested largely in technology mm -hmm. yeah. to alert our citizens. Uh, but we need them to stay aware of their surroundings at all times, uh, have a plan. Sure. And if they see something or feel they're threatened, don't wait for that knock on the door or confirmation from an alert that they need to leave. They need to go ahead and take appropriate action to protect their family, yeah. their property. 
yeah, preparedness is a is a big piece, and um, you know, uh, self responsibility is a big piece too that that we'll discuss because I think when we get into like the evacuation piece, that's really important, but also the awareness, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so. I think that takes us back to different alerting platforms. Yeah. So we've talked about um, Everbridge or Citizen Alert. Mm-hmm. We've talked about our, our cell phone app or our mobile app mm-hmm. uh, for, for mobile devices. Uh, but what other – and then, of course, landlines. So what else? Yeah. Um, and then we'll get into the, the big one, which is door-to-door, right? But we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so Jackson County also has access through the Federal uh, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System, or IPAWS. And this is what gives us access to both the wireless emergency alert system, um, which most people know you receive AMBER alerts on that one. Uh, it'll hit your cell phone. And the EAS, or the emergency alert system. And that's your radio and TV broadcasting. So we, we have the ability to send messaging through both of those networks as well, um, depending on the situation and what sure. kind of messaging is needed. Um, Both of those messaging platforms are more of a broad range. Your EAS, uh, which again is TV radio broadcasting, is going to hit an entire media market. So that would be all of Jackson County and some of our surrounding counties as well um, with whatever that emergency messaging is. So we definitely use it when we when we need to get um, things out broadly to our community um, and uh, that sort of thing. And then our wireless emergency alert, um, that's the one that'll hit your cell phone, whether or not you're opted in and you have a a WIA enabled phone. Um, But there are character limitations on those. So so it's either 90 characters or 360 characters. So the zones, again, can help us when we're trying to communicate evacuation areas because it helps just give a frame of reference and um, coordinate with the description of the area that we yeah. put in there. So, um, and that's, we would use that, uh, a good example would be during the fair. Um, we have a lot of people on the expo fairgrounds that yeah. aren't registered there, but if something happened and we needed to give them some emergency messaging, that would be a prime example of when we would use the wireless emergency yeah. alert to allow that population to know what was happening or what protective action needed to be taken um, you know, per the incident. Mm, great. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, you know, that the whole alerting thing is a, is, is a big responsibility. Yeah. And so uh, us as people that are serving our public, you know, we don't want to use an overreaching platform to do a tactical uh, advisory to our public. Sure. Because you can you can bring more people to the area, you can cause panic, you know, and you can also, there's the whole thing, that the boy that cried wolf. Yeah. You know, if we want our citizens that if that that big alert comes that says, hey, we are having a uh, earthquake in the Mm. region or there's some sort of regional issue, we want people to take notice of that. Yeah. So we don't just constantly hit that and hit that to where they just start to ignore it. Yeah. So it is a big responsibility. And I think we do use it very well here. Yeah. Yeah. There there is a um, I mean, we were talking uh, yesterday. We had a like a summit on evacuations and we had a neighboring county down in California, um, you know, share their experiences with a lot of, you know, significant evacuations that they've had due to emergencies. And just talking about that, there's no perfect platform. Mm -hmm. Right. No matter what you do, you'll never reach everyone um, and you'll never satisfy everybody's need for information. So it's like, how do we do our best to to. Uh, reach as many people as possible with a message that they can absorb and, you know, pay attention to. Like you said, over alerting is a thing Mm -hmm. um, as far as like desensitizing people to uh, emergencies. And so, yeah, that's uh, so what what do you find um, the most effective is? Is it the door to door? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, it, it amazes me that still when we go door to door, how many people aren't on citizen alert and stuff like that. So it just reaffirms to me the importance of if there is, you know, some sort of emergency going on, how important it is for us to get door to door. And so people know. Yeah. Because everything's not perfect. You know, everything is one tool in our toolbox. Right. Yep. And un- un- unfortunately, the, 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 the most effective piece that we have in that is looking somebody right in the face or posting their residence so they know yeah. if they return after we've came through that, hey, there is an issue. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I know that's, uh, you know, we try to get to all the residents in a level one or level two type 
uh, you know, notice of potential evacuation mm-hmm. uh, because of the importance of, of that face-to-face or that human interaction and describing the emergency and, and what's going on. I, I think that is very effective. In fact, yesterday we were talking about, you know, the, the um, I guess the, um, the need for affirmation or reaffirming uh, the emergency. So, you know, if you get an alert, are you really going to Oh, is this happening to me or is this relevant to my property? And then they want to call a friend or a family member or check Facebook to see what that's saying. And just to see about a deputy or somebody from emergency services, firefighter coming to the door saying, hey, look, there's a problem. You need to pay attention and you need to you need to get your stuff ready. That seems to be kind of like the final word in most instances. So we try to do that and we have a great search and rescue team that volunteers a lot of time and our deputies are getting, unfortunately, uh, have done it a lot to where they're getting, you know, pretty good at it. And some, I say comfortable or good or proficient is probably the best word of, of getting into an area and uh, making notifications. Yeah. And then not only does it, does it bring that citizen to know that, hey, there's this real and we need to pay attention to it, but it opens up those line of communication. Yeah. Because, you know, when we come through, we always leave them with a citizen's <laughs> alert brochure so they can sign up if they're not. And then we tell them about the app. We tell them about all these things that open up that line of communication. And we also explain to them that, you know, we, ha- we, have, we have a big job. There's only so many of us. And we may not be able to get back and yeah. tell you if it goes from a level two to a level three. We're going to do our very best, but we we, we can't guarantee that that's going to happen. Sure. So then we, we convince people, you know, like we said, taking that personal responsibility that, hey, please pay attention because, you know, we, we may not be able to get back even though we're going to do our very best. So, you know, we've been talking about alerts and, you know, how people can stay informed and preparedness, um, you know, realizing that there's a lot of platforms and a lot of ways to get information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that information is good uh, or sometimes it's not, right? And sometimes it needs to be verified. And so, you know, we realize that people use a lot of different like apps, Facebook uh, groups, uh, they have individual community groups. They might have bigger groups like like Scanner Page, which is really good about putting information out about initial events in our community. Um, There's different apps like Watch Duty, Pulse Point, or all these things that provide information to the community that people use. But I think it's really important to kind of kind of um, make sure that people, you know, trust but verify, you know, or, you know, check the information with their local emergency providers, you know, whether it's Fire District 3, Emergency Management, the Sheriff's Office, ODF or a combination of those because that information, while it might be a little slower coming out, we have to verify and vet because we are an official source. You want to talk about that a little bit and, you know, what your experience is and maybe how people use those platforms, but also circle back or come back to the information that we provide? Uh, well, I'll say, you know, for for a lot of us uh, looking at that, the pulse point application on your phone um, that is tied directly to the 911 dispatch. Um, so whenever there is an alert that comes out on a type of incident and within the application, you can decide what you want to be alerted about structure fire or just vegetation fire. Um, when that goes off, that's an official notification because it, it is a call type that that is being mm. actually responded to by first responders. So, you know, like I personally use that one. It helps just that initial notification. Um, but then after that, you to your point, there's a bunch of other applications you could utilize. Then after that, I really look at the social media components because that's where there's going to be official information from yeah. the sheriff's office um, or from the impacted fire district. Um, that's going to that's going to give you more information um, that's been verified embedded um, from as an official source. Yeah, absolutely. Our goal is to get timely, accurate, and important, valuable information out to our citizens. Um, knowing there's a whole bunch out there, one of the d- experiments that we have in our in the field right now, and we're subject to it, is the quality of our radio communications. And there's a lot of skips and poor coverages, and we have limited number of frequencies, so there's a lot of overlap. And if you're relying just on a scanner or a radio rebroadcast, you might be picking up multiple incidents, multiple uh, conversations, and uh, really confuses the context of the communication. Yeah, and I think that's something uh, that we have to adjust and adapt to is people listening to radios and in language that we use as first responders that we're familiar with uh, may uh, cause alarm or, you know, have people 
interpret what's going on differently than what it means to us. Say, for uh, example, when we say, hey, we're doing level one evacuation notices, someone might hear evacuations and say, oh my gosh, they're evacuating people, when it's really a notification to uh, you know, an event that's going on. So we have to be careful of that. We're realizing that we have to adapt our practices with the time. But it is really important to hear those things you know, if, if you listen to the scanner or their broadcasts through non-verified platforms to come back to the, to the organization that's, you know, uh, managing the emergency, so to speak, and, and get the, from the source. I mean, what do you find, Sean? Yeah, so, I mean, the citizens have to do the same thing that we do, right? We have a toolbox. So, you know, they can use Wash Duty, all these the scanner pages, everything as information, you know, quick information, but then just verify, like you said. Yeah. So they can keep that in their toolbox, but, but verify before you make big decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that kind of leads us into a great segue of preparedness and knowing your zone and being situationally aware of what's going on in your community and your county. But then what you're going to do in the event of an emergency, I think a lot of people uh, might wait or be, you know, lackadaisical with their approach to preparedness. Um, And, you know, we can't reach everybody in every emergency. It's not possible. Um, And I and I find that, you know, there's there's often critiques of how things are done, which I think is we critique ourselves. You know, I think we have after action debriefs on just about everything we do. Uh, that's big, right? Not every call we go on, but there's a lot of you know an- analyzing and and self reflection on events. Uh, but one thing um, that we find is is that we don't. I think the community is is critical of of what we do, and and I think that's normal, right? I think anytime you're an authority, people want to critique uh, the approach that was taken. Um, so, a recent example of the Salt Creek, there were some posts about over notifying uh, by by zone right by we caused undue panic and alarm uh because the zone was too big and that the fire so you know we look at that and we say okay that's information that you know we can obviously analyze and look at but you know when you look at it there was a lot of factors that went into why we picked those zones and i mean you had a great example yesterday of the fire behavior of where it was going the wind and what it was doing and the lines that it had jumped or the road and and so when we talk about communication, I think it's it's good to make people aware, right? In any situation, a level one is a pretty minor notification. Don't you? I mean, yep. I would think. Yeah, it's uh, information. That's that's yeah. and that's what people event. have. Yeah, There's an emergency. And that's what people have asked for in the past is information. Yeah, and so it's like if you give out too much information, they're upset. If you don't give out information, they're upset. Um, <clears throat> I you know with level one uh, back in seventeen and eighteen, we had a lot of fires uh, all over. And, um, you know, we, we said, if you live in Jackson County in the rural areas or even in the cities mm-hmm. and it's, it's summertime, you should be in level one always, you know, and obviously we've learned that there are things that get impeded if you actually do an official level one notification or level two with regards to like sales of homes and properties and insurance and all that. So we can't just put the entire county on level one because it would, it would be easier for us. Um, but really, people should be um, paying attention during fire season, especially in the rural areas. Sheriff, can I talk about how things go for alerting? Right yeah, now? yeah. So a fire breaks out. I'll give you a Salt Creek for for a, uh, just as, as an example. Yeah. So everybody responds. Uh, Oregon Department of Forestry is responding. Uh, local fire chiefs. Uh, Chief Hussey, we're all responding to the scene. And when we get there, we're not just making a knee-jerk uh, decision. So we, you know, meet at, at a safe place in the command post. We have unified command and everybody plays their part. You know, I'm, I'm not a fire expert. The chief is, you know, ODF is. They can give us information where we can all make a collective good decision on what is best for our citizens. And if a fire like, like Salt Creek is so erratic where one minute it's going one direction, the next minute it's going another you know, it makes the most sense to light up those big areas because we can't guarantee which way it's going. You know, today, how long has Salt Creek been going? We still can't guarantee that. Yeah. So I think that we, we, we took appropriate action 100%. Oh, yeah. 
And uh, we're going to continue to do that. And we don't do that in a vacuum. Um, We're not listening to information over a radio or on the Internet or anything like that. We're in the field and we're talking to everybody's expert and their piece of it. And we're getting good information and putting out the best information that we can with the information we have at the moment. Yeah. And I think a really important aspect to, to also talk about is when, when fire tells us this is the behavior of this fire in this incident, we look at how many houses are there, uh, how much time it would take for us to mobilize to, to notify people of the emergency, um, you know, so we look at all of those things and that goes into our notification process because, you know, we have what we call uh, decision points, trigger points and all those things. Like we know it's going to take us this much time to mobilize to get to people. And so warning people appropriately and early enough is, I think, important in that and considered in those processes, all of the things. And so I think, you know, people are critical at times, but um, like I said, I think, I think the, uh, a level one notification is, is pretty minor and it puts on a, a situational awareness on those things. And we had a lot of people concerned at the initial outbreak of that fire on Salt Creek because it, mm-hmm. a big plume kind of close to town, you know, we, uh, obviously from the fires in our past, everybody is very sensitive, including myself and all of our first responders to fire. And mm-hmm. it's a big deal here and for good reason. So. Yeah. And it's been my experience as well, Sheriff, is that once we, we, we put an area in, in an evac zone, um, depending on whichever, all three levels, <clears throat> that the people that live in that area, uh, they're not upset. They're very <clears throat> thankful yeah, yeah. that we're there watching and taking care of them. It, it's kind of the outside where we get the pushback. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we just kind of put that aside because we're there to serve the people that are in immediate uh, danger or they need to be paying attention. Yeah. Um, from a fire pr- perspective, um, you know, when we do notifications, uh, in this fire, we had to put out, I think, an advisory or a request for people not to come into the area to, to be looky loose. Yeah. And so that's a real thing. And so those things are considered as well when you're talking about, uh, emergency and, in and, and putting things out is the, some of the, I guess, consequences or the byproduct of those alerts and the attention that these incidents bring. Can you talk about that from, from a fire standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. You know, all the responders from law enforcement to ODF to structural agencies are uh, responding quickly into the area. And as evacuations are uh, alerted, the intent is to get people out of the area. And with this incident, our access uh, became compromised. And it becomes even more so when we're bringing the heavier equipment and consider low boys with big dozers coming in and the water tenders, it just becomes uh, very difficult. And it's very dynamic as the fire moves around. As Sergeant Richards mentioned, the wind changed multiple times and ran different ways. Yeah, And so we find ourselves pulling back, going different uh, sure. directions yeah. to try and get ahead of it. Yeah. Now it's, um, it's a thing. I mean, uh, you know, human nature, we're curious. And, uh, you know, you don't sometimes realize the impacts of our actions. I think uh, – and. Was it in the Aru? Somebody flew a drone uh, in the Applegate, which shut down lights, which, you know, that can mean the difference between getting ahead of something and then now having to go back and try to pick up some pieces. So really, you know, we need to keep, uh, you know, people who don't have authorization or need to be there kind of out of the areas. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And that's probably one of the most critical uh, elements. Uh, anytime there's a drone in the air, we have to sit all the aircraft down. And you take Applegate, a fa- fast-moving fire, uh, we need the aircraft. We yeah. had nine aircraft on Salt Creek, and a drone will compromise, really hamper the efforts. Yeah. So um, preparedness. So, you know, we've had some, uh, some um, a few people say, oh, the zones are, are not effective or they're, too much or too confusing. And it's like, well, have you ever tried to draw a polygon on a map and then try to articulate that? Um, um, the zones are much easier. So it's really, I think, what we really want to press a, upon our, our public is to know your zone. It, t- it takes some responsibility. Know what zone you're in. Know what zone your family's in, your your children's school's in, or other things that are important to you. Know those zones. And there's different ways to do that. Like, good example uh, we heard yesterday. Uh, create a list and put it on your fridge for your kids mm-hmm. or, um, you know, post that uh, somewhere in your house or send a text message, you know, just something to become 
familiar with your zones and know them and know the zones that are important to you as a, as a, as a person. Um, cause there's no way that we can make the perfect communication plan. So there is some self-responsibility and there's ample ways to know your zone. Uh, can you talk about like where you find out where you live and how that looks? Yeah, there's a couple different ways to, to look up your zone. You can go to the county's website, so jacksoncountyor.gov slash knowyourzone. Um, there we'll have additional information um, about what the zones mean, um, links to a, a county webpage you can look up, but also links to the Genesis Protect webpage, which is publicly available. Um, Genesis Protect also provides an application that you can download onto your phone. Look up your address there. You can favorite your... Uh, I think it's favorite or star your zone, zone. you live in. Um, and then if you allow it, you can actually receive push notifications through their application when your zone is put onto an evacuation level. So mm. there's multiple avenues based on the you know technology that our, our residents have available to them. Um, but that's the best way to get in and know your zone and get more information about it for sure. And then, um, sir, you're absolutely right. Uh, putting a magnet on your fridge with the zone number. Um, I also heard uh, the inside of your mailbox, you check your mail every couple of days. So you're going to open that. And right there, you can put the zone on just so you get that muscle memory yeah. um, of the zone that you live in um, or add it to your keychain, uh, that sort of a thing. So I'm um, just finding those little, little ways to mark that number down can be really beneficial. Um, Cause to Sergeant Richard's point earlier, one of the key tenants of our zone is to ho hopefully be able to communicate more effectively with our residents when they are dramatically impacted because previously we would have to describe the area so and it would be a north of this road south of this road east of this landmark type of thing and that can be hard to think through in the throes of an emergency because we all react a little differently once that stressor is put on us as an individual in our home that just received an alert and now i have to find out is this me Am I in this zone somewhere um, that's being described? And now if you know that number, if you see that number, you can connect the dots and then implement hopefully the preparedness plan that you've been working on with your family. Yeah. Um, so I think that's it, it kind of leads into that uh, transition from getting that initial response to how do I effectively take action as myself, my individual and my family to um, either evacuate, grab my go bag, get my animals, uh, get the children and, and some food and get into the car yeah. um, and be able to leave quickly and effectively. Yeah. So that preparedness piece, I mean, obviously we, we would love to see everybody have a plan, uh, whether that is a go bag or whether that's predetermined location for animals or other mm -hmm. things or whatnot. But uh, a big thing is situational awareness, right? So I think there's some aspects of the community that want us to plan everything for them to say this is your evacuation route on you know this emergency and this is a way you're going to go and this is you know what you're going to do but i don't think that that's healthy for a lot of reasons one is and we were affirmed this yesterday by the sheriff of uh, butte county who had done uh, several evacuations that every plan that you make as soon as the emergency happens basically goes to hell in a handbasket right so that you have the plan and then the plan gets punched in the mouth so to speak so you know, having people um, pre-programmed to a certain response for an emergency, I think can be dangerous. Um, I think, you know, it's better to have a situational awareness of everything, you know, multiple routes of, of uh, escape from an emergency, knowing you, all the roads around you, the arteries, the side roads, uh, because, you know, depending on the emergency, we don't know what road might be closed or what road might be impassable due to power lines down or other mm. things. And so having a plan of where you're, you can shift easily and not panic, I think is important because we, we've seen a lot of, um, interesting things with human nature, I think over our career. Um, and in the Almeda, you know, an example is, you know, I five got blocked by truck drivers who abandoned their trucks on I five and basically shut down the entire lane. And so we had to send out, you know, uh, detectives to go, remove trucks from I-5 so we could use that for, um, you know, people um, uh, leaving or for emergency vehicles ac accessing, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the fire scene. So, you know, just you can't predict human nature. And so the more that we prepare, I think, is important. What do you, what do you think, Chief? Oh, absolutely. You know, 
everyone must have a plan, whether you're at your residence, your business, or you're, you're out recreating. When you come into another community, maintain the situational awareness, your head on a swivel. Uh, responders can't be everywhere all the time, and you have to have some personal resilience. Yeah. John, you, and you know your risk. Yeah. I mean, everybody has to analyze their risk. You know, if you live in the middle of town, your risk may be different than if you live in a rural community, a uh, forested r- rural community. So you may have to have a completely different plan. But so everybody just has to do a self evaluation of what their risk is and then how do they prepare to mitigate that risk to the level that they want to. Yeah. I would I would add into uh, when you really start looking at the make a plan and build a kit, it can seem very overwhelming. Um, like I can't spend five hundred dollars to go buy this backpack with all this new fandangle stuff in it. Sure. Um, and I think I always uh, encourage people to just kind of take it back a step and look at what you currently have in your home. So when I do my spring cleaning, um, I'm looking at my oldest kids clothes that they are growing out of, but they're still in good condition. Well, I'm going to put that in the go bag for the kid that's younger. So I don't need to go buy new clothes or new sweater or new shoes. Um, I already have those things in my house and maybe they're just the older version and I'm going to put it in a backpack um, for them and a go kit. Same with your food stores. Um, My kids love chili. Yeah. So when I go to the store, I buy an extra three cans of chili for $1.25 and I put it in the back of the shelf, right? And so I'm going to cycle through that. I'm not going to lose that food or waste mm-hmm. that food because my kids are going to eat it. Um, but if I have to evacuate or I, I'm s- sheltering in place for a couple of days without power, I can uh, I have a can opener and I can open that food and provide for my family. And I know my kids are going to be able to eat it. So just look at the things you currently already use that are in your house. You don't have to spend a lot of money. And then we, I also, my one other tip on building your preparedness is every time you go to a store that has a camping section, like Walmart, Buy Mart, Freddie Meyer, um, go to the camping session and buy one thing. And maybe your budget this week is the 97 cent Mylar blanket, right? So because it's going to provide you some heat coverage and maybe my budget next month is a $30 water purifica- uh, purification straw. Yeah. Um, so just one thing a month to be able to add to your family preparedness so it's not overwhelming because every step you take, no matter how small, is just increasing your resiliency or your situational awareness so that when and if that alert comes, you know you have something, you've done some work, you've thought about the process of what that looks like and what my family needs um, when they need to evacuate. Yeah, because every emergency may not require evacuation. You make a good point, you know, shelter in place. And there's some, you know, um, I think like this this year it seems we've experienced more uh, power outages Mm -hmm. than we have in the years past already. And I know there's a lot of uh, safety things built into the power lines now. and But that does cause outages more often when there's a hazard or a fire in the area. So, you know, being mindful that, you know, there there's there's some things you can do to, you know, weather those power outages. Uh, we can prepare a little better and, and think about those things. I think it's important as well. Yeah, and where you're most comfortable. Yeah. You know, that, that nothing's worse than being evacuated and then getting evacuated again. So, you know, have a plan where you're going to go. Are you going to go to the local shelter that stood up or are you going to go to a family member's house? And maybe a family member in another community Mm -hmm. might be better than the community that you're in that has the emergency going. Yeah. You know, what's your comfort level? Personally, you know, I like hot water and air conditioning. (laughs) So uh, I've I've got pre-planned spots from here to Los Angeles that I'll just (laughs) go as far away as I have to to be comfortable. So everybody has to make a decision for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point too. You know, is, um, as we know, like, you know, worst case scenarios for our, for our Valley was, you know, the Yoba chain and Alameda fire where we had mm-hmm. multiple communities that were displaced. And so, you know, there's very uh, likelihood if you would have left the Alameda area, uh, you know, in the South County and then went up North that you would be evacuated again. And that, you know, we had to, I think we had all Butte Falls and Shady Cove mm-hmm. under level three evacuations. Um, and that's a, that's a big deal. It's a, it's a hardship for uh, the uh, the public for sure, but getting displaced over and over could really be uh, an issue, huh? Absolutely. It's really important that we look out for thy neighbor. We uh, mentioned earlier about notifications for neighbors, but also we have a lot of residents who don't have a mode of transportation mm-hmm. or they're going to need additional assistance or additional time 
to get out to a safe space or help uh, if they stay in their own location. So uh, make sure that you do have that plan for yourself. Uh, understand plans of neighbors or needs of neighbors, yeah. be it uh, medical issues, medications, livestock, or modes of transportation. Yeah, It's a community effort. Sure. That's a good point. In fact, is there a means if people have needs to kind of uh, pre-alert um, first responders or sign up for, you know, additional resources or help in the event of an emergency through the county? Yeah. So we, uh, Jackson and Josephine County actually partner with Rogue Valley Council of Governments or RE COG um, to maintain a, what we call the disaster registry. Um, so those individuals who have additional needs um, or might need some additional time or space, as Chief Hussey referred to, can actually register with um, the disaster registry. And then uh, both counties, emergency management and first responders, get access to that list so that we can view. Um, so if a zone now was to go into a level three, we would be able to look at that zone and see anyone that was pre-registered that may need some additional assistance that can be prioritized um, or get those the resources that would be needed to support that individual or that household. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can go to the county's webpage, again, jacksoncountyor.gov slash emergency. Um, there will be a disaster registry sign up there, or you can go to the RV COGS website um, and see the disaster registry there. Yeah. In uh, Fire District 3 has a pre-incident planning platform, and there's a public-facing component mm -hmm. as well. If you go to jcfd3.com, click on Community Connect, you can register your residents. And all the way down to telling us uh, how many animals you might have, the hazards, what the priorities for salvage might be, and it's automatically pushed to our responders. Mm. If, and it's outside of wildfire. If we were to respond to a structure fire in your neighborhood, it would light up and tell us what some of the priorities were, how many residents are in place. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. Yeah. Do, what, do other, some other districts have the Community Connect, don't they? Yeah, we're trying to expand it throughout the county a little bit more. So if you're unsure if your agency uh, does have Community Connect, just go to their webpage, uh, snoop around a little bit, and you'll find a link to Community Connect. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then I know, Sean, when, when we go door to door, and do notifications. We take notes and we have a program that we use to say whether or not we've been to this location or not. But we can also, at that point, identify potential, uh, you know, needs of individuals who might reside there. And, um, you know, so if we have to come back, we have a kind of a heads up. Yeah, especially le level, level one, level two. Yeah. We're going to take that extra time. Mm -hmm. to uh, get that information. Sure. And level three, we're going to be going door to door as quickly as we can. Sure. But level one, level two, absolutely. We may ask you, you know, five, 10 questions depending on your answers. And we're just gathering information to see how we can best help. Yeah. So lots of avenues to, to help uh, your community members that might need an extra uh, resources or help during an emergency. Uh, but again, the, the pre-planning, the notification early really helps us out and helps us respond uh, adequately the first time instead of maybe having to come back or delay that response to that residence if there is a level three need or something like that. Absolutely. We need help helping you. Yeah. Oh, we, and this is the big thing. It's like preparedness, preparedness, know your zones, know the levels. Um, and I guess we could talk about that really quickly. Like level one, uh, just to kind of recap is be ready. Just so. be ready. Just be, be in the know, right? Like okay, there's a thing. And like you talked about, you're always ready because of your background, right? You're always like thinking of sheltering in place or if I have to leave. Yeah. Uh, but people who don't live in a first responder world or an emergency management type world often don't think that way because there are other priorities, right? And so, um, but level two, we got it up here on the yeah. screen. Be set. So that means danger is close. Um, and if you need more time to evacuate or you have your livestock animals, um, older adult uh, individuals with disabilities, that is the time that you're really looking at implementing that emergency plan that you've built with your family, friends, or caretaker um, to get out of out of the area because it may switch to a level three um, as we've already talked about, wind direction, things can switch pretty quickly. So that's the time to really be prepared to go. Uh, make sure you have gas in your gas tank, um, your go bag, and maybe some of your essentials loaded into your vehicle already um, where you start thinking through that process. Yeah, because once level three hits, that's, that's, that's time to go. It's time to go. That's yeah. the you're grabbing your family first, and hopefully you can grab animals. Um, but if not, you know, that's your, you need to just leave immediately. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I think, you know, best practice, if you can do it, not everybody can do it, but during the level two is you're, you're moving vulnerable uh, individuals out of the out of the area already, finding different accommodations potentially. Um, and I understand people not wanting to leave their home. I wouldn't want to personally, but in, in the level two, um, but, you know, each person has to make their own choice. Uh, but certainly getting... Um, you know, my kids or my wife somewhere else and me staying is, is one way of thinking of things. It's different, right, than, than trying to pack up everybody in emergency and get out. Um, you know, talking about fire and evacuations, you know, and people staying, we have that happen. Uh, we have quite a few people who chose not to leave um, during all sorts of events, um, even under level three. Um, what can they do to prepare their property to be less vulnerable to fire? Well, that preparation starts in the fall. Fall, okay. Right? Start thinking about the fall, develop a cycle for winter, and uh, be doing the hard work in the spring. Uh, I can't overemphasize getting the grass knocked down. We have a generous grass crop this year, Mm -hmm. and it's contributing to rapid fire spread. An example, yesterday, a mowed field, we were able to get on it quick. It spread quickly, but we were able to get to it uh, more rapidly and uh, suppress it. Yeah. If it hadn't been mowed, it would have uh, burned two, three, four times the amount of acreage prior to our arrival. Oh, wow. We just can't, uh, we need the people to go around and knock down all of the uh, flammable, flashy fuels, some of the larger woody materials, uh, limb those up. Don't wait for the fire event to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or don't do it don't when it's 110 degrees out work. because then we yep. end up yeah. starting fires. Yeah, yep. we are in extreme fire danger. So right. The there. firefighters <laughs> won't do that work for you. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, I think, um, you know, watching a, a fire unfold on Table Rock the other day, uh, maybe a week, two weeks ago, yep. you know, and watching the, the, the fire teamwork, Medford and you guys, to, to get a handle on that quickly. Um, but, you know, the image of, of one man with a garden hose trying to put out this fire was completely ineffective. And so staying there thinking that you're going to be able to defend your home in a, in a major large fire, I think, is, is not realistic unless you have some real significant equipment on site. Absolutely. We're bringing a, a lot of water, a lot of equipment to the fight, and it's not always effective. Yeah, you know, we're flowing uh, 100 gallons a minute at times, and it's just consumed through evaporation or the wind, flame lengths. Um, that's why I'd, we call it the complete coordinated response. Sometimes we need things from the air to uh, really suppress the fire to a point that we can get in and cut some line around it, either with dozers, with hand tools, or lay some hose lines around it. It's a volatile environment. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh I mean, it wasn't a, a, a huge fire to start. It was fairly small, uh, but it grew very quickly. And then, of course, then the residents got involved. Um, I was surprised how much effort and water it took to just to get a handle on that with all those teams there. So imagine one, one person with even a big fire hose wouldn't have been effective, you know. Needed a real team approach and a lot of response. And uh, another component on the becoming more prepared around your home would be the FireWise program. Um, So here in Jackson County, we do have FireWise coordination. um, And that would be you and your community. So we're back to that kind of community preparedness, which is really like that grassroots baseline um, where you're going to have the most interaction and be the most resilient. So you get together with your immediate community and households. You're going to reach out to your fire district or fire department. Um, They can come out and do an assessment of the homes and give you the work that should be done, as Chief Hussey alluded to, where, hey, you need to, you know, that first five feet around your house is the most important. So get all of the bark away from your home. Um, And then these trees limb these up. So they'll give you the list of things that you can do within your around your house and your neighborhood because we're going to see um, you know if there's one house with lots of flammable material around it that's going to be more likely to spread to the house next to it versus if we all get together and work as a community to protect our community and our surrounding areas so yeah. you can become a firewise community within your neighborhood that's also a really good way to build that overall preparedness um, because you're getting to know your neighbors so I can understand that Aunt Sally lives next to me and maybe she's in a wheelchair um, so when I get that level three to Sergeant Richard's point I know hey I need to go check on Aunt Sally next door to make sure she is either out already or has a plan. Sure. Um, 
as we're as we're working within the community for that. So um, that's another avenue. Again, just you reach out to your local fire department or district. And if you're not in a fire district, then you'll reach out to ODF um, and they'll be able to come and support you in that. And that usually happens again, starting in the fall through the winter into spring um, is where those assessments will happen to give that the list of things to do. Yeah, uh, reach out to your local fire agency. They have yeah. someone on staff that will come out and walk around your home and help you develop a plan. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with a lot of the fires that we're seeing, uh, you know, I, I, you know, obviously they're they're going to be investigated as to the starts, but traditionally, I think you know, human mistake is is a cause of a lot of these. Yeah. Um, you know, operating equipment or doing things in extreme fire danger, or even fire season can be pretty hazardous. And, uh, you know, I can't stress the importance of, of being aware of what's going on around us, where we are at fire season, and not using these power tools or doing these things. Um, I mean, you, you go to way more fires than I do, but... Yeah, the conditions we're seeing right now are more uh, relative to mid-August. Yeah. We're ahead. And the best ounce of prevention is preventing the fire from starting in the first place. Mm-hmm. And yeah. be it dragging chains, uh, mechanical failures of your equipment, using spark emitting devices around dry grasses, power tools, even shooting or recreational activities that pose a risk. Don't let probability play into your decision making. Yeah. I think of uh, Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent forest fires, right? Like that kind of thing, that that old uh, uh, ad campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I think as we kind of uh, wrap this up, I want to you just kind of review some of the things. So sign up for Everbridge, yeah. right? Or Citizen Easy Alert, mm-hmm. right? Um, get our app. Stay uh, aware through whatever means you're comfortable with um, and also understanding that no one platform is probably going to be the answer to reaching everyone. Mm-hmm. And so multiple tools, I think uh, Sean touched on that, is you know we have lots of different avenues to notify people. But at the end of the day, it's going to take a community to, to work through these emergencies. Um, mm-hmm. And again, preparedness. Know your areas. Know your zones. Um, we go through that one more time. Zones, I think you can't hammer that enough right now because that's a new thing. But know your zone and be familiar with that and where your loved ones live or your work or whatever. Whatever it is that's important to you, know those zones and understand that that's how we're going to be notifying you for the foreseeable future. And it's way more effective than um, what we were doing in the past. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, know your evacuation routes. Uh, know your roads, um, understanding that, you know, we can give a description of north of this and south of this and east of this and west of this, but most people probably don't have a good handle of directions or even cross streets. And that's another thing I think when people are critical of like zones is I can memorize three numbers a lot easier than I can remember all the cross streets and what directions I'm at. And what if I live on a tilted access and everything is northeast and southwest versus, you know, north, south, east, west. So, you know, there's there's some, uh, I think, significant benefits to the zones. Um, anything else you guys have that I want to discuss today that we haven't covered? Um, I would I would just like on the preparedness front, um, the Jackson County in collaboration with Josephine County over the years has created a, a pretty robust preparedness web page. So it's mm. rvem.org. Um, and there uh, it's tied to our family preparedness handbook um, that is available. There's the PDF versions there, but it's a very extensive preparedness from preparing for house fire to evacuation wildland fire to sheltering in place, um, building shelters, hygiene, water, all of that um, available again at rvm.org. Um, and that's also where you'll find more information on signing up for Citizen Alert um, and and how, uh, how as an individual and family community, you can become more prepared. All right. Sean, any any final thoughts for today? Yeah, none other than just know that, you know, like everybody at this table and all the local agencies, we're all working together to try to bring the, the, the best solution to our community. So give us, you know, have some patience and help us out in every avenue that you can. You know, maybe keeping your neighbor from coming down the road to look or, you know, anything you can do. Yeah. And being prepared is a huge help. Mm-hmm. So anything you can do to help support uh, the local responders because we're, we're going to do our very best to keep people safe. Yeah. 
You know, as uh, the Valley has a lot of career firefighters, and as you move more to the rural areas, they rely heavily on volunteers. And we get a lot of questions, how can we support or what do our firefighters need out in the field? They need help. And if you can find a way to help those volunteer fire agencies, whether volunteer, just be active in fundraising, they operate on limited funds, and they're serving their community, Yeah, find a way to help them out. Great. Well, I want to thank you all for taking your time and being here today and uh, helping share this important message for our community. And, and hopefully we can get through the rest of summer without any fires, right, and emergencies. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir.